Greetings, this is Jim Lindsay. This is your lesson over topic five, which asks the question, are violent video games harmful to children and adolescents? And so we're going to be looking at video games, specifically violent video games, and then any sort of impact, harmful impact specifically, uh, those may have on kids. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, this lesson is being delivered to you from my uh, porch, so I'll, I'll make this as brief as I can because it's cold out here. Um, but I wanted to to share. I, I'm really man. I wish we were together because this is a topic which usually gets people pretty amped up and people like it a lot. Um, and so there's a ton that we could talk about. There's a, there's two full days of, of class that we could be, I think, having a lot of really good give, give and take with this. And so um, I'm not. I don't want to short you any of that, but at the same time. Um, I also realize this is an online delivery, and so it's also a little bit harder to uh, to listen to somebody talking for uh, you know huge amounts of time. And so I'll try to um, move this along as as expeditiously as I can. So thank you for being here. Thank you for your uh, your attention to it. Um, let's get started. This is the the page on which this is from the submit assignments page. Uh, this is the folder for topic five. As you look at this, you'll see, of course, you have a quiz, you have an issue analysis, which you're supposed to complete for this uh, this topic. And as you come down here, you're already watching a lecture. Good job on that. As you come down here, uh, files for issue 11 or topic 11. Uh, this is uh, topic 5. I'll, I'll change the, the wording on that. So files for topic 5. Um, what you want really to be working from is this issue 11 notes, because this is issue 11 in the textbook. Um, it starts on page 148 in the textbook. And we're just everything comes from the textbook for this for this topic. Um, but as you look at this, it's a word document. As you can see, it's you've seen this from uh, other topics that I presented you with. These are sort of when I was was creating this this lesson. This was my thought process. This was the outline for how I wanted to present this to you guys and, and questions I wanted to ask you. And so you have my notes. And so as we, you know, I'll be showing this to you and alluding to this quite a bit because this is really the the framework from which I will be working and how I would be working if we were in the classroom as well. And so what you see as you, as you look at the top of this, um, there are links out to several different cartoons and on the class stage for this particular lesson, I try to get to the classroom really early and maybe like 20 minutes early, at least 15 minutes early. And then as you're coming in, be playing these clips for you and not even saying anything, just be playing these for you in the background. If you look at these, and I can't play them for you because if I do, YouTube will basically not allow me to show you this. Uh, they'll, they'll block this video. Um, this is copyrighted stuff. And as you look over here at uh, those links, this is some uh, Sam Sheepdog and uh, Ralph the uh, the Wolf here. This is sort of the predecessor to Wiley e. Coyote, and man, it is funny. I love I love this is probably my favorite cartoon. Um, Sam Sheepdog and, and and Ralph would just basically, um, you know, they'd go to work. You'd see them clock in in the morning and clock out at night. They'd talk to each other, clocking in and out, and then they'd go about their business of him being the Sheepdog him being the wolf, and they're just really funny. Um, this is uh, Looney Tunes, Bugs Bunny kind of stuff. Um, but when I was a little kid, I remember this was on TV, you know, and so this is, to me, this is like cartoons. When I, This is what like cartoons were like with growing up. Um, next you have Foghorn Leghorn and the, uh, and then, you know, the dog. And again, <laughs> uh, I, I encourage you to watch some of that. It won't take you too long to get the point. Um, and lastly, what I have, I have a link out there to some some Three Stooges. This is before my time. I mean, you could watch Three Stooges growing up, but uh, uh, you know the point. There's a, there's a theme going through there. As you go from Sam Sheepdog to Foghorn Leghorn to to the, to the Three Stooges, and I don't have to articulate it. Um, as you guys are sitting here watching, class, you're laughing while you're watching it. But at the same time, then when we get to a little bit later in the lesson we'll come back to and we'll allude to this. And so that's how this, this day would start out. Now, as we get into the lesson itself, uh, as you look at page 148 in your textbook, there are five different learning outcomes 
for this this uh, this issue, this topic. And I take the first learning outcome and I break it out into four different statements because the way it's written is actually pretty bad. I think that the it's very hard to understand what they're trying to get across with that. It's, it's, it's a huge compound sentence that they, they put out there as the lear, first learning outcome. So I break it down into its chunks. So these are the learning outcomes. You, you can read. Uh, you can, can look at those. But these are the things we want to take away from having this entire discussion, right? So uh, learning outcomes A through E are the things that we're going to be looking at as we go through and look at this, this material. Okay, and next what I'd like to talk, talk about with you is who are we hearing from? As, as we look at the written submissions for the yes and the no side of this topic, who are the authors? And you have two terrific authors in this case. You have Stephen F. Gruel for the yes side. You have Patricia Millett for the no side. Um, and these are legal briefs that you're reading. Uh, they're very easy to understand legal briefs. They're written in very... Uh, almost almost in layman's terms and uh, so it's not some hoity-toity kind of language that you know like what does that mean you know they're very clear about what they're saying but these are probably two of the better if not the best written passages in the book um, the amount of research that they reference is phenomenal and so as you go through here and as you're looking at this you know they're very much these are very accomplished attorneys both of them and they're trying to make their point and they're backing up everything that they're saying they're backing up with evidence from this study from that study from that state from that study and that's what makes this so hard to to decide on you know to make a decision about because both of them come at you with a tremendous amount of evidence scientific evidence so you know how if just one of them did that you go oh well of course it's going to be with that person because they prevented scientific evidence and the other person didn't. No, they both come at you with scientific evidence and it's like, wow, who do I believe? And so that's why this makes this a really cool, kind of fun topic to um, to, to investigate. Um, as you look at the links for both of these, these individuals, you'll see, for example, that uh, Stephen Gruel was a prosecutor uh, in the Major Crimes uh, Office uh, out in Los Angeles big time attorney man uh, now he's in private practice you can see he's got stuff going up through like November of 2019 um, I mean if you had if you were but he's doing criminal defense now uh, I believe you're looking over here he's doing yeah criminal defense now so let's say you're uh, you know in trouble because for some big huge felony kind of crime this is the kind of guy you would like to hire um, if you had the money um, this guy is very much a very accomplished he started. Again, he started as a prosecutor. I like to say he started on the on the on the, uh, on the good side, and now he's gone over to the bad side. He's over working uh, doing criminal defense. Um, I know that's a terrible thing to say, but um, you know this guy's has uh, had an entire career of uh, very uh, successfully um, navigating the, the the legal world as an attorney. Likewise, uh, Patricia Millett is the author of The No Side. Um, she currently is a judge, and she is a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals uh, up in the, the District of Columbia right now. Um, she wrote The No Side, and as you can see from the uh, the text right there, she's basically been a an attorney. Let me pause this. There's a, some kind of big truck driving by my house. Okay, sorry about that. Um, she has argued 32 cases in front of the Supreme Court as an attorney. Um, she is good. I mean, she and, and you can see from both of their writing that they're very uh, logical people. They're very persuasive people. But these are your authors for the yes and the no. And so they, they definitely have the juice. They definitely have the, uh, I think, legitimate skill sets that as we, we read these things, these are people... Uh, who we want to be, you know, taking, uh, basically looking at as credible. Um, there's another page I have for you where you can actually watch some video of Judge Millett in action. So if you're interested in such a thing, you can check out, you know, arguments in her court. And so she is, you know, like I said, a judge now. Okay, so I switched back over to the notes. I wanted to give you the context 
for which you're hearing from Gruel and Millet. Um, this is part of a case called Brown versus Entertainment Merchants uh, Association. And so this was a case out in California back uh, when Brown was the governor. Um, you'll notice as you look at the, the, the proceedings for this thing, it actually changes from Brown to Schwarzenegger because uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger became the governor after Brown. And so this case started with um, the tenure of Brown as governor and then while uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was, was governor, that's, it continued on into it. And what happens during this case, let me show you this website. This is, this is the oye.org. It's O-Y-E-Z. This is a really cool website. If you're interested in, in, in learning stuff about the Supreme Court and court cases, um, I encourage you to really check out this, this website. Again, it's oye.org. Use that link right there. When you do, you'll find this information about the case. Okay, so like I said, uh, Gerald Brown was the, the governor when this started, and so the state of California passed a law. The legislature uh, at, in California passed a law, I want to say in 2010 is when this all started. It might have been, yeah, started like 2010. Uh, and the law said, it basically said that we want to limit, we want to basically outlaw the sale of, of violent video games to kids. And uh, the manufacturers, the creators, the software developers, and the sellers and stores like GameStops and people like that, they were all like, whoa, 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 hold, on, hold a second, you know, you, you're going to do what? And so again, the state's trying to like outlaw the sale of violent video games to kids. And so they're saying like, no, what, so that's why you see the Entertainment Merchants Association. It's a whole bunch of bodies, entities that, that deal with uh software and specifically on um, games and they're saying like no this is unconstitutional you're basically violating first amendment rights you're violating 14th amendment rights and so that's where this case came from um the entertainment merchants association sued the state of Gov uh, state of california and as you look through this as you look through this um this 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 uh web page You'll see, you can actually listen to the oral arguments. So that the Supreme Court stuff, uh, uh, you can see like 2010 is when the arguments were made before the Supreme Court. So this probably started back around like 2008, 2009. And then by the time it got to the Supreme Court, it was 2010. And then the opinion, opinion announcement is, and so you, you click on that, you can actually listen to the, uh, listen to the justices making their, you know, listening to the presentations from Gruel and from Millet, and you should, you should listen to that because, man, they grill them. Um, you know, you guys make presentations in class and we're, you know, everybody listens and we're, you know, we try to be civil and nice to one another. You should listen to this because these justices will just beat the crap out of these attorneys, and they should. I mean, this is the, not, there's nine of them, there's one attorney trying to speak about their side of this thing, and the justices, for both attorneys as they get up there, just brutalize these, these attorneys. You know, asking this question, that question, that question. What about this? What about this? And it's and it's important, and they should do that because those attorneys are trying to ask for opinions, which are going to impact every single person in this country through policy, which basically it gets shaped as a result of this decision. Um, it's very, it's a very important part of our democracy. And so, check those out. Like, listen, listen to the oral arguments for a couple of minutes. It's um, and you'll see it as you do that. The different voices that show up on the screen will it'll sh like show you which justices are talking. For example, um, these are the justices on the Supreme Court at that time. You'll hear Scalia talking, then you'll hear Ginsburg talking, then you'll hear Roberts talking, then you'll hear Alito, you know, speaking, and it, it's highlighting and giving a transcript of, of what's going on in real time as you listen to that that uh, that argument. Very cool stuff. Um, what happened with this case? is basically the, the Entertainment Merchants Group won. And they won at the, the basic level. The, the state of California appealed, so it went to the second level. And at the Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit basically affirmed, they basically said, yes, the basic court had it right, and uh, you win, earn it to Entertainment Merchants Group. And so California appealed again, trying to get it to where they could um, you know, ban these, these games. And so it goes to the Supreme Court and the question they were asking was, 
you know, does the First Amendment bar this state from restricting the sale of these violent video games? And what the Supreme Court held and what they found was basically they found that, again, in uh, just like the two lower courts, they affirmed that initial decision. And so, now it wasn't uh, it wasn't a, a, a unanimous decision. Um, you'll see, like there's a vote of seven to two, and even within the people that voted to affirm that that lower uh, decision, the reasons for it differed. And that's that's again what's so interesting, I think, compelling about this case as you read through and read through this, this information. You know, even the people that agreed with the lower court saying that, like, no, they should be allowed to sell this, they agreed that they should be allowed to sell it for various different reasons. And so, um, please again check out this web page and check out these these resources They're really cool you can like as you're looking at this you can see um, the information presented in different ways you know by ide by, by ideology by seniority etc um, very cool site now these two documents that we're reading that were written by gruel and millet um, they are they're basically called briefs of amicus curiae and I, I hope I'm pronouncing, pronouncing that correctly. They're getting their brief of amicus curiae. And what that means is that they are not the attorneys for these groups, for the state of California or for Entertainment Merchants Association. These are outside opinions. These are basically um, when, a, when a, a court case goes before, or when a case goes before a judge, the judge can allow outside opinions to also come in. So in addition to the person suing and the person who's getting sued, in addition to these two people, you can have, the judge may allow if they want it, uh, if they want to, they can allow other parties which may have some sort of stake to also uh, input, you know, provide some input. And so that's what a brief of amicus curiae is. And so it's it doesn't always have to be and, and I had I didn't know this until I started I learned about you know that we started working on this information for this class a couple of years ago but I called one of my friends who's an attorney um, up in for the state of Kentucky up in Frankfurt and he goes oh yeah yeah that's you know sometimes you know some judges will allow that others won't it sort of depends but uh, these two documents we're reading are things that were allowed to be entered into the record the Supreme Court justices read these things. Um, they uh, they got to uh, consider these things, but these aren't necessarily you know these aren't necessarily even the what you're hearing from Entertainment Merchants Association or from the state of California. These are just from people that Gruel and Millet represent, which feel like they've got a dog in this fight. And so that's what an amicus, a brief of amicus curiae is. And so that's what we're we're, we're learning about. What we're learning from and what we're reading with regard to this case and and as before i close this I just i think i stated earlier you could hear from uh, millet and um and gruel in these arguments and you don't you hear from uh you hear from morazzini and and other attorney uh, the other other attorneys for the, for the these actual parties and so again because this is the because these are briefs of amicus curiae uh that's 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 why you're not hearing from them in, in these in these recordings here so to finish this point up, I have one more link for you, and that's from uh, what you see right here. You know, what is a legal brief? It's come from LegalDictionary.net. As you can see, it's basically a short, concise statement, and it's a document that presents a legal argument to a judge. When it talks about to a court, it's to a judge uh, that's that's presiding over a court courtroom, explaining why that side feels it should prevail over the other side. So that's what a brief is, and these are briefs of amicus curiae. So let's get to the um, the specifics of what these guys are, are telling us about. Okay, so to get into the material specifically of this case, I wanted to just give you some information about the video gaming industry. You may not be a gamer yourself. I am not myself. Uh, I don't. I mean, I'll, I just don't play games. It's not some, video games. It's not something I've ever really gotten into. Um, but Lots and lots and lots of people do. How do we know that? Well, let's look at some numbers that, that bear that out. As we look at that link right there, this takes you out to the uh, uh, wpc.com website and it talks about 
and this is as of January 2020, just different statistics about this industry itself. As you scroll down here, just look at the very top part. Um, in the overview, this is a $90 billion industry. And that's it's grown nearly uh, $11, $12 billion since even 2017. I mean, it's huge. There's a, a massive number of people that play these games, spend a lot of money on them. And as a result of that, it's just, you know, it's going to continue to get more and more development and attention. Um, as you go through and look at these other statistics, you can see, uh, you know, information about where the games are more, most, more popular than, than uh, you know, other, and, and other parts of the world, um, et cetera. But what I really wanted to kind of hit, so take a look at this website, and I think very quickly what you'll, you'll glean from this is that video games are a really huge uh, part of a lot of people's lives. And you probably know that. You may be a gamer already. But I did want to show you the, the gamer demographics information because this is, I think, really relevant to what we're, we're talking about. If you look at the gamer demographics come down here. It talks about 64% of the general U.S. population you know, claims to be a gamer. That's from a Nielsen study. The average male gamer is 33 years old. The average female gamer is 37 years old. And that comes from some uh, you know, studies done by the Entertainment Software Association back in 2017. So as we're talking about violent video games and how those impact uh, children and adolescents, you know, children and adolescents um, aren't really the, the, you know, the average gamer. The average gamer is a grown-up, which I think has an impact on what gets developed, right? You know, if you're thinking about your target, your, your target demographic, who do you want to appeal to? Well, if your average person that you're appealing to is a 33-year-old man or a 37-year-old woman, you're obviously going to do, develop something different than what you would develop for a 12 year old or a 14 year old because they're they're at total different points in their life right and, and their life experiences and what they want and what you know what motivates them to spend money is going to be different and so these demographics are I think something you guys need to be paying attention to and again where that came from I've got this link to the video gaming uh, the video game industry sales and, and usage stats check that out you guys can dig in that into that even further um, on your own, but I think this this speaks to uh, very much to why video games are the way they are, and to the likelihood that they're they're probably not going to change, and to um, why you know you know why this issue is something that we're talking about at all. So let me jump on back to my notes. Okay, so I won't I won't dig any deeper into that myself. I'll let you guys do that. And um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on it, as well as, um, you know, just in the interest of time, there's other stuff that I, th I think I should probably be talking about, right? So the next thing, just to keep your attention, I'm going to jump on to my next um, idea I think that you, you need to really take something away from. One of the learning outcomes is where you start to learn about um, correlation versus causality. You know, what is correlation? What is causality? And I want you to watch this video right here. Um, I will show you what it looks like. Okay, what you see here on this, this screen is this is a, a web, it's a YouTube video from Khan Academy. And maybe you've used Khan Academy uh, before, but it's a, it's a great resource if you're trying to remember something from algebra, or remember something from. Um, stats or some you know some other subject which you know you, you know you took and you forgot it um, you can jump on the Khan Academy's website and pull stuff and go oh yeah that's that and so this I want you to watch this video it's about 10 minutes and he goes through and talks about correlation versus causality he does a wonderful job of it I won't if we were in the classroom what I would do I would lead a session really similar to this and and come away with the same lesson, but because we're not, because you can hear from somebody different, I think anytime I can turn you over to somebody different at this point, that's valuable. So I want you to watch this. So watch this correlation versus causality movie, and where you get that link is right there in the uh, from learning outcome A area of the notes. 
and I'll make a, a, a separate link to it in the uh, on the blackboard page for you but um, check out this video because this is something you need to know period if you're going to be a college graduate and you're going out and you're trying to solve problems uh, for your companies that you work for you need to understand correlation and you need to understand causality how because those are different things and different uh, factors uh, may be correlated but not be uh, you know causing one another and that ability to recognize that and then to deal with that appropriately is a skill set that you just have to have um, so watch this and this is uh, alluded to uh, what and the way you're gonna, you're gonna see this uh, playing out in the readings is basically what Stephen Gruel will present to you as causality uh, Millet will present to you as correlation and so then you as the the reader here as the person that gets to you're the judge here with this you get to take what they're saying and decide which one you believe you know are the factors that gruel is presenting you actually causality things or are is uh is millet right and we're just seeing things that correlate to one another instead so that's where you know watch this and you're going to see this play out through the entire entirety of both readings the yes and the no sides all right, another outcome, learning outcome B, it wants you to be thinking about the ways in which playing violent video games can influence the neurological structure and functioning of a person's brain. So how does your playing uh, Halo or uh, Call of Duty, how does that impact one's brain, specifically a child or an adolescent's brain? and that's what you know they want you to be considering and so as we look at this uh, what I would do in class I would ask and this is where my exercise science students I, I really uh, call on you guys um, and I typically have one or two exercise science students um, in, in class at any, any at any one point and say hey I want you to come up here and please coach us on how to do a good air squat and so if you've never seen an air squat, this is what an air squat looks like. So let me jump over here to this right here. Um, this, is a, this, is a, this is not an air squat. This is a picture of a human body. And what I want the exercise science student to do is coach us through the process of how do you do a good air squat. And then using this anatomical chart here, what muscles are impacted by that air squat? And so what, what does an air squat look like? Well, it looks something like this. And so let me just play this this video I'll just talk over the top of it it is a CrossFit movement that it's an exercise movement that um, as you can see from different angles here you're trying to get your hips the crease of your hips down below your knee you're trying and you're, you're standing up it helps you with balance it helps you um, in a number of different ways but this particular exercise is sort of a one of the foundational movements within CrossFit I've been doing CrossFit for a number of years and I, I and so I like this movement. You don't have to have weights for it. So like times right now, like this whole COVID-19 thing, not a problem. You can do air squats all day long and it, it is, you know, work on your fitness, right? And so that's what an air squat looks like. So I would ask our exercise science, scientists to basically walk us through that, have you guys do that during class and say, okay, here's the chart, which body parts were, were impacted by that. And of course they're gonna say, well, your legs are, you know, your legs right here because you're having to squat down um, your abdomen because you have to kind of tighten up your stomach even maybe your arms the way that that guy was doing it he had his, his arms out in front of his body you know for balance as well as you know that's going to maybe work on the, the shoulder muscles a little bit if you keep those out there you know the whole time you're doing it um, a whole bunch of different benefits come from you know to your body from doing this one movement this this you know it's a kind of a compound movement right and so that's that's what we'd be doing in class and then what I'd do is I'd kind of circle over back to the book and start to present you things with uh, from basically pages like 152 and 153 of the, of the textbook. And at the same time, I would present you with this right here because this is a picture of a person's brain. And I am not a biologist. I'm not a doctor. And so um, I'm going to mispronounce some of these things, but I wanted to read you one or two little passages out of the book and this so this is from page 152 
in the book. This is part of Stephen Grohl's arguments as part of this brief. As recently as June 2010, another study of violent video games effects on frontal lobe activity was published wherein it was concluded that playing a violent video game for only 30 minutes immediately produced lower activity levels compared to a non-violent video game in prefrontal reasons thought to be involved in cognitive inhibition. So he's talking about this part of the brain up here. So just like, you know, we were talking about a second ago, you know, if you do an air squat, it's going to help you build up these muscles in your, you know, the front of your legs, the back of your legs, your, your rear end, your abdomen, potentially even your shoulders if you have your arms out. You know, that makes sense, right? Because you, you feel that as you're, if you, let's say you did 10, 10 air squats right there in the classroom, go, yeah, I can feel that in my legs. What they're saying here in the in the brief is that as you play a, a violent video game for even just 30 minutes, the parts of your brain are impacted in a similar way. They're the parts of the brain which basically uh, control uh, how you respond to when you're angry. It says that those are inhibited, and that, that and that um, this this video game play you know, very, very quickly will start to make those parts of the brain function um, poorly compared to like if you'd played, let's say, um, some other game where you had to uh, maybe find a treasure or solve a problem, um, maybe it would have stimulated those parts of the brain in, uh, in contrast. And so that's like one passage from, from page 152. Another is, uh, here. listen to this one right here, and this is where I'll probably struggle with the the pronunciation of some of these, these uh, parts of the brain. Research strongly suggests an underactive uh, research strongly suggests an underactivity of brain inhibitory mechanisms in the frontal cortex and stradium coupled with hyperarousal of the amygdala and the temporal lobe regions is responsible for chronic explosive and or severe aggressive behavior. Research clearly indicates that areas in the frontal lobe and Amidale may be activated by viewing violent television and playing violent video games. And so again, I know I, I, I really did a bad job on those pronunciations, sorry, but what he's saying, this is from Stephen Gruhl's argument, he's saying that, hey, research says that this part of the brain which controls you know, how you basically re react once you get angry about something, that gets messed up by playing violent, violent video games. That's me paraphrasing. And so, um, that's one of the things they want you to be thinking about as you read his brief. Now, in contrast to that, if you read uh, the millet section, which you, you know, you're supposed to do, what she's going to say is like, hey, look, I know Gruel is going to tell you that this part of the brain is, is you know, impacted negatively by playing a violent video game. But the way in which they did that research, the, the, the methodology of that research was just terrible. You can't believe that. Um, the way that they tested you know, violence was just you know, not realistic and it wasn't, uh, um, it didn't make any sense. And so again, you have somebody who is also articulate, who's also bringing in uh, Science and telling you that no, no, what you just heard that's not correct. What's correct is this, and so <laughs> that's where this is so hard. It's like, wow, who do I believe, right? And so that's that, that's what I wanted to hit with this this particular learning outcome. You need to be reading these things, thinking about them, and deciding who you believe. Okay, let's jump over to learning outcome C, and that's basically what we're. Uh, where we start to investigate does violent video game play, play um, have negative impact upon one's academic performance? So, uh, you know, does this make you a, a worse student than if you didn't play violent video games? And so, as we look at the, the evidence produced to support this uh, from, from Gruel, um, let me just read you one or two passages. This is from page 151 in the text. Several studies have documented a negative relation between the amount of time playing video games and school performance among children, adolescents, and college students. So 
it goes on to talk about why that may be. It talks about something called the displacement hypothesis. And essentially what the displacement hypothesis says is that a person who uh, may not be, you know, all things being equal, let's say there, there, there are some people standing there and some of the people standing there are, are not as good at school as, say, some of the others. Well, because they're not as good at it, they're going to choose to do something other than school stuff because, you know, who wants to go out there and do something they're not good at, right? That makes sense to me. And so, in, in contrast to school, maybe they're really good at video games and so they spend their time playing video games. And so, that's one of the reasons perhaps for uh, people spending a bunch of time on violent video games and then having poor school performance. And, then, and there are other reasons given. You can, and you, you can read about those. Um, And I hope you will do that. You know, again, I'm, it's pretty short. These readings are pretty short. And so I hope you're going to spend the time, you know, reading through here. And that particular argument doesn't necessarily have to even be specific to violent video games. That could be, you know, any kind of video game because if you're going with that displacement hypothesis, you know, uh, a kid who, who doesn't feel like they, they do well at math or biology but feels like they do great at any kind of video game may prefer to spend their, their time playing video games or playing basketball or running or doing crafts or something like that. You know, who likes to do something that they're not good at? Um, so that's one of the things you need to consider. That's where, again, let's come back to, let's circle back to correlation and causality. Are those things that are simply correlated? Or are those, is one thing causing the other? That's what you have to decide. You guys get the hard, the hard job of deciding that for this issue. So, um, that's information about uh, learning outcome C. And again, uh, the no side of that, as you look, read Millet's um, explanation about these same sort of facts or, or 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 ideas, she really questions the validity of the methods that were used to come up with that those findings. You know, you can't trust that because they use this, this, and this in order to do that study, and that's just, that doesn't make any sense. So, those are some things about learning outcomes B and C uh, that, that I want you to pay attention to. Okay, let's move on to our learning outcome D. And in this one, we're looking at, we're basically going to do some comparing and some contrasting. Um, the government does regulate, or uh, other sorts of media like movies and TV through a rating system and that's been around for a long time and so what people proponents of the uh, of the yes side basically say like hey well we we already rate uh, TV and movies and even streaming stuff now so why shouldn't we also have to do that for video games and so and, and we do, and there, there is a rating system for video games, and you'll see that as you look at this, but that's learning outcome D, and so they want you to basically think about, you know, if we, if we have ratings, if we have controls in place so that, you know, a child can't watch, um, you know, pornography, then why shouldn't we also have uh, things in place to prevent a child from watching, you know, or, or playing a really violent video game? That's the that's the thing that they're wanting you to consider here. And so, as you look at the links on this 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 page of my notes here, it talks it has links for stuff from the MPAA. It has stuff from the uh, Federal Communications Commission. It has stuff directly from Netflix and Google, etc. Um, and from ESRB. That's the uh, the rating system for software, uh, the Entertainment Software Rating Board. And so I have links to a number of different uh, organizations and their web pages, and there's a worksheet for this. If you look on the website, look on the, the uh, Blackboard site, one of the documents is an Issue 11 worksheet. And if you open that up, what it looks like is this. It's a series of questions, and we would complete this during class. And you do this in pairs. And so essentially what you do, you start at the top, and it kind of starts you with movies and 
you know, from all the way back in the 1960s to present, it gets you thinking about from one of these really old types of things like movies all the way up to, you know, video games. Let's kind of do, let's, let's figure this out. And so you look at the rating system for movies and how that changed uh, in the late 1960s up into the present. As you go through these questions, uh, you start to see it starts to, it moves its way into video games. And so if you use these links uh, in the notes, you can find the answers to those questions. Um, I have a completed version of this, which is also there. I hope you will, it's, you see the completed issue 11 worksheet. I hope you will try to complete that yourself first. Um, you can go and look at my answers afterward. You know, that would be my request for you. But I have the completed worksheet out there as well. But what you're going to find as you go through that, that worksheet is information that, uh, hopefully will make you help you make a decision about you know do I think you know if, if we're doing this for TV and for movies should we have the same kind of thing and we do do we have that should we have that sort of thing for software for games specifically and then what should the job of that be and so uh, to, to get you to hopefully be thinking about this part of your issue analysis is to answer uh, some questions based on this sort of um, thought this sort of analysis and so um, that's the worksheet that uh, I want you to be working on another resource that I have posted for you this movie ratings rules um, it says see pages 8 to 10 when you look at this document it looks like this it says 6 and I can like re I can relabel it but but, but um, it's page it's page 8 it's uh, there, look, there's like some cover pages and stuff in the beginning um, but this section three, where it starts talking about how they come up with stuff for G versus PG versus PG-13, et cetera, this can help as well. And so that section three is really what I'm alluding to when I provide this to you as a, as a resource as you, as you think about these issues. Okay, and so I also want to do to, to see and hear from uh, players that were involved with the, the creation of the ESRB and to do that, I have a link to a, um, a documentary or a little a short film um, about this topic. It, 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 there's a link to it right there. If you open up the video, it starts right there. It's about 31 minutes total, so I'm asking you to watch about three minutes of this. You start at about the 28 minutes, 14-second uh, mark, and there's, there's Joe Lieberman. He ran for president at one point. Uh, if your parents walk by and see this, you're going to what's Joe Lieberman doing on there? Um, he was in Congress at the time this was going. He was a big driver in what was going on in the video gaming industry, and then how he wanted to respond to it as a you know he wanted Congress to respond to it, and then how the industry itself reacted to that is how I want you to um, I want you to learn that. And so watch this starting again at about 28. Uh, 28 minutes 14 seconds watch I can't play that for you because it'll mess up my video to where I can't um, they'll, they'll ding me for copyright and so watch that from that link I'll, I can also post that as a as a separate link but um, again be thinking about how the software industry basically took that input they were getting or that that motivation from Congress and then turn around and did something with it to uh, come up with this ESRB and that's you know the ESRB exists because of what Congress what was doing what, what Congress was going to do and so um, I want you to, to learn that story I want you to hear that um, so check that out from that source right there and that's all part of learning outcome D and your last learning outcome is this what you're seeing right here Think about a movie that you've watched that was violent, you know, Lord of the Rings or um, a Quentin Tarantino movie or something, you know, some kind of violent movie. Um, then contrast that with a violent video game, if you've ever played a violent video game. How are those experiences similar? How are those experiences different? And what the, the authors will 
what the author of the yes side will say to you is like, look, in playing a violent video game, you know, because as the, the player in the video game, you basically dictate what's going to the courses of action. You know, as they program that game, uh, the game responds to choices you make, and as a result of having that input, um, it has a, a more significant impact on your, your brain than just watching a video, watching a movie. If you watch a movie and a car blows up, or if somebody punches somebody, well, you really didn't have anything to do with that. You were just standing there watching it. But in a video game, if you choose to press the button so that the car blows up or choose to press the button so that the person gets punched, then the authors of the yes side are saying that has a much more significant impact on your your, your, your neurological development and is going to help make it to where you're um, less empathetic to people, you're more likely to punch people in real life, you're more likely to be explosive and, and um, unpredictable when you're angry. And so that's what's coming to, coming from the authors of the yes side. On the no side, and let me give you actually two things at once for the no side here. There are two articles I have links at here for because as you read the book, essentially what the authors of the no side are saying over and over again is the science that the, the people on the yes side used was just terrible. You know, they didn't actually have people go out and punch other people. They were something else that they were substituting for punching somebody. Um, and so you get that 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 constant uh, chorus, if you will, from the, the no side saying, like, just the science was bad, the science was bad, the science was bad. So I wanted to give you two additional things on the no side because it, it can be a little bit difficult to present the no side with, you know, if all you can say is, like, oh, the science was bad. Well, here's some additional resources for you, this one and this one. And if you look over at those resources, you'll see uh, there's this article right here. Let me move Lieberman over. So this television and video violence article coming from APA.org, it's American Psychological Association, as well as from Psychology Today, this uh, Dr. Gray, and an article he has about um, sense and nonsense about video game addiction. And so um, I want you to, especially if you're on the no side, you know, dig into these because this is going to help you have more things to, to use as arguments other than just the science was bad. Um, let me give you one example here. Like over here with uh, Dr. Gray, I like this guy. I, I, um, I like his writing, and I, I hadn't heard of him until just a couple of years ago when I started to teach his class and started to, to read, you know, and all these different weird kind of topics. And this guy comes up as, uh, as an author that I've, I've um, you know, I can understand and I, I think uh, writes things well. But one of the things that's a quote in our book. Uh, it's not in, in this issue, it's back, I think, in like issue number 18, which we don't even cover. But it talks about how, how uh, when you use digital devices, it's, it's, it, it impacts the same part of the brain uh, when you, as when you do heroin. And so if, let's say you took a, a hit of heroin, the amount of uh, uh, chemicals released in the brain which give that pleasure um, are the same ones that people get when they... Uh, use digital devices, and as you read through this article, what he's saying is like, whoa, whoa, whoa! This guy, you know, Dr. Cardis, Carteros, you know, wrote this article saying that that's, you know, it's like digital heroin. You know, this guy is messed up in his in that statement because, um, yes, that is the same part of the brain, but the amount of uh, chemical get, that gets released to basically give that pleasure is not the same as cocaine or as, as, as heroin. It's about the same as if you ate a good piece of pizza. And so that's really, so I, I like how this guy, he's got a, a background in neurology and, and the chemical stuff that goes on in the brain that he can interpret some of this stuff in such a way that you're like, oh, okay, okay. So, um, you know, you can uh, maybe put some of this stuff into, into a, a better context. And so, again, here are two articles for... Uh, people on the no side, again, those come from the uh, bottom part, last, you know, for, for learning outcome E, uh, as you guys work on this issue. Uh, that's it. That's what I have for you. Thank you guys for your attention, and I look forward to your analysis of this topic. 
Um, I'll put those additional links out there for um, the ESRB video uh, and the other. And have a great day. Thanks. Okay, there's one last thing I forgot. Um, I showed you guys the, these uh, videos for Sam Sheepdog, Foghorn Leghorn, and Three Stooges. And my point with those uh, was when I was a kid, and those videos were on people, you know, they beat each other up in those in those cartoons like you wouldn't believe. Um, and people always said, like, hey, if you watch those movies, you're going to become a psychopath. And so that was one of the... Um, one of the things discussed as I was growing up, and I think this is kind of like when that was the discussion going on for my generation, this is the discussion going on for your generation, is how video games impact one's neurological development uh, compared to, you know, like for us it was, you know, the cartoons where they beat each other up or the Three Stooges. And so um, I wanted to close that circle. I brought that up in the beginning and then didn't go back to it. So sorry for the, the last little bit. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Have